event that is taking place in Kansas that we just saw the advertisement for the faith explosion in Kansas where they're going to be celebrating uh, 20 years uh, there as faith builders. We encourage you to watch online. It's going to be really good and you'll be blessed by it. Praise God. One of the things that I wanted to remark on, you saw that testimony of Sister Tanya Washington. Her, her husband, Anthony, he does have a lot to say usually, but they just didn't catch that part on the video clip. He just put in his amen at the end. But Sister Tanya, God did such a work in her life when she uh, was raised. She was raised in uh, Jehovah's Witness. And God brought her out and, and brought her to the church and she was like a sponge and just began learning and learning and soaking up and learning how to pray. Prayed her children all in to the kingdom, into the church and they're serving God and, and, and walking in his favor. And she also, her and, and her husband just became the children's ministers up in the uh, Kansas location. And she had written... Uh, one of the new books that we have out here in our bookstore, hashtag stay in the word. It's a devotional that she just released and she's getting ready to release a children's curriculum for the nursery curriculum that she is and children's books that she's written. So God has just done such a work in her life and it's an honor to see how people grow when they get under the word. You know, it's, it's really interesting to see when people just really embrace and let the word of God fuel their, their heart what flourishing can take place of all those things that God had placed in a person for years and it just begins to come like, like uh, Pastor Larry was saying, he's fruit of the word of God transforming his life and to see uh, what God can do in a person's life is something that should always inspire us. Amen? Amen? One of the things I want us to give our attention to this evening is the authority that we have in Christ Jesus. It's something that we discussed two Sunday evenings ago when I was last with you on a Sunday night. And it is part of something that we have been focusing on for a year and a half, our position in Christ. We began a year and a half ago talking about our being in Christ. And this being in Christ from 2 Corinthians 5.17 that says, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. All things are created new. This phrase, to be in Christ, is a, a, it denotes and illustrates a fixed, definite position. A position that is geographically real in the spiritual realm, if you could put it that way that you are in Christ. This is our place. We are in Christ, and it should be the place that you and I as believers do everything from, that we from this position in Christ, we pray from our place in Christ. We operate and exercise our authority from our place in Christ. We walk in the light from our place in Christ. The phrase in Christ, if you were to look at in Christ, in Him, or in whom. Over 130 times in the New Testament, the Holy Spirit uses these, these prepositional phrases to indicate what belongs to us in Him, in whom, in Christ. What we can do in Him, in whom, in Christ. All of these phrases are used by the Holy Spirit to point us back to our place in Him, our being in Christ. And our authority in Christ is such, a, um, such an important part of everything we do in life. Because if you are not aware of your authority in Christ, you're not going to pray accurately. You're not going to live accurately. You're not going to be able to stand against things that are from the curse in this world or things that are even from the attack of the enemy without a firm confidence in your authority in him. And in our last session, talking about our authority, we actually took a pretty close in, uh, inspection of why Jesus attained authority on the earth. And I, I'm not going to go back through all of those things. I encourage you to go back and look at the video or order the CD. They're free in our word supply. Uh, but I want to, um, from that perspective, just kind of revisit some 
important things to, that are going to lead into today's teaching. And I want to go all the way back to Genesis chapter 1, and I want us to look at the authority that God gave man. Jesus came legally as a man to this earth because God had transferred authority on the earth to man. So in order for him to gain the authority that he has gained, he had to legally come as a man. He had to strip off all of his God uh, privileges and come in the form, in the fashion, legally as a man. He wasn't just faking being a man. He wasn't pretending to be a man. He legally became a man. And this is a very important aspect of our our capacity because if we don't identify with him if we don't identify with him as our legal representative as the one who gives us legal authority to operate this authority and do it accurately according to the word of God we won't be able to fulfill the things that he needs us to fulfill and that he has uh, uh, um, assigned for us so Genesis chapter 1, let's read verse 26. God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps upon the earth. So God created man in his own image in the image of God created he him, male and female created he them. And God blessed them and said unto them, Be fruitful and multiply, and replenish the earth and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the fowl of the air, over every living thing that moves upon the earth. So this dominion that God had given to mankind was part of his assignment. It was part of his purpose. It was part of the responsibilities God had given to mankind. He blessed us and gave us dominion. Dominion is part of the blessing that was conferred, that he proclaimed. This proclaimed, announced blessing included dominion. And it included the ability to exercise the authority. It wasn't just an authority like, here's the badge, but figure out how you're going to make it happen. you got to find your own bullets, you know. He not only provided the, the responsibility, but he gave the, the authority to command and to dominate. Have dominion means dominate. Dominate. Take authority. Take authority. And so... Because God had legally given man authority, this is something he legally conferred, and when man fell, that authority came under the control of the adversary. When the adversary tempted Jesus in the temptation, he tempted him with dominion. He took him to a high place and he showed him all the kingdoms of the earth. And he said, if you will bow down and worship me, I will give you dominion. He said, these have been given to me and I will give you dominion over these kingdoms if you'll bow down and worship me. Well, God didn't give him dominion over those kingdoms. How did he get that dominion? He got it because Adam submitted himself in the fall. Adam, in obeying the instructions, in obeying the words of the adversary, brought mankind under that control. And so the, the word of God refers, and we read it from a scripture this morning in 2 Corinthians 4, 4. It says, the God of this world blinds the minds of those who do not believe. Referring to him with a lowercase g, not a capital G, not showing honor and respect as the Lord God Almighty, but showing that he is operative in the world with an authority that he, he because of Adam's fall, the authority, he began to operate in it. But praise God that Jesus came to destroy the works of the devil to take authority back for mankind. And that's what we see when we look at the book of Hebrews. And I love the fact that Hebrews chapter 1 starts out referring to the fact that God 
is speaking to mankind. He said in the past he spoke to us by the prophets, but in these last days he speaks to us by his son. And he begins right here in Hebrews chapter 1 to, to identify Jesus, the son of God, as the heir of all things, the same one who was used to make all of the worlds. He is the brightness of God's glory, the express image of God's person or his substance. He upholds all things by the word of his power. And then it begins to it begins to identify how much greater Jesus is than any of the angels and how that God has never said to an angel, this day have I begotten thee. He's never said to an angel, your throne is going to rule over. You're going to have the scepter of righteousness. He said all of those things to Jesus, identifying him as the one who is preeminent. And then when we look at chapter 2, he goes back to the fact that God is speaking to us by the Son and says that we should give more earnest heed to the things which we hear from the Son because these are the things that the Lord confirmed with signs and wonders. And we also see that it then begins to talk about this scripture that we referred to from the book of Psalms. He's quoting from Psalms 8. And he says in verse 6, But one in a certain place testified, saying, What is man that you are mindful of him, or the son of man that you visit him? You made him a little lower than the angels. You crowned him with glory and honor and did set him over the works of your hands. Look at Psalm 8 and let's see this which is being quoted here in this text. And understand that in the book of Psalms, the Old Testament, which is written in Hebrew, in this text, the word angels in verse 5 is accurately, it is the actual, if you look it up in Strong's Concordance or in a Greek dictionary, it is the word Elohim, which in Genesis chapter 1 verse 1 is translated God, in the beginning God, in the beginning Elohim. When we compare this in Hebrews, when Hebrews is writing it, Hebrews is quoting from Psalm. And so I'm, this, this text from uh, Hebrews chapter 2, verse 6 being in Greek, when it says you made him a little lower than the angels, that's not the word Elohim in the Greek text, but it's quoting Psalms. So he's, he's quoting Psalms. And I'm saying that because if you go to look it up in Greek, it's not going to say Elohim because it's not from the Hebrew language. Do you understand why I'm saying that? But if you want to see what they were referring to, they're referring to this, which the translators of King James Day translated as angels. There are other translations that translate this God. You made him a little lower than God. Religion has a problem with that. Religion does not want us to be identifying ourselves in the family of God. I, religion doesn't want us to see ourselves as sons or as righteous. Religion doesn't want us to see that God is good. And especially to know that He is our Father. But Jesus said, I've come to show you the Father. I want you to see the Father. I want you to see His goodness. How, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth who went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed for God was with Him. He was demonstrating the will of God. He was expressing the will of God. Amen? This quote, For you have made Him a little lower than Elohim. You have made Him a little lower than God. If we were lower than angels, then God created his family lower than his servants. If people who try to say this is saying God has made him a little lower than the angels, we're, you're putting angels on a higher place than family then. We just read Genesis chapter 1, how God created us in his own image. In his own likeness. 
He would not have put us lower than angels and said angels are more important and angels are closer. There's no salvation for angels. That's why the devil has no place of repentance. That's why the devils and all of the demons that went with him, all of the fallen angels, there's no place of repentance for them. There's no salvation for them. We are not created lower than angels. We are created a little lower than God. We're in his family. We're in his likeness. We're in his image. And it takes the word. We've got to walk in the light to see that. Amen. We've got to let the word of God renew our minds because religion has spent hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years trying to convince people of how we're worms and, and, and the whales are more important. And, and we, we've got to bring ourselves up to the word, truth, and recognize we're in the family. We're in the family. He has created us just a little lower than himself in his image, in his likeness. And he has crowned us with glory and honor. In the original plan, in before the fall, man was crowned with glory. Man was crowned with honor. Crowned with glory and honor. You made him to have dominion over the works of your hands. From the beginning, this was God's plan. From the beginning, it was God's intent that we would have dominion on this earth, that there would not be one thing that could get out of our control, that we didn't have the authority and the ability in that authority to bring it under subjection, to bring it back down to its place where God's will be done. That's why God intended for us to enforce his will on the earth through that dominion. He intended for us to walk in, in, in line with his plan. And when anything would try to get out of order, when anything would try to revolt against the ways of God or, or go contrary to, uh, contrary, contrary, whichever way you say it, contrary to the ways of God that we would say, no, no, in the name of, we would say now in the name of Jesus, but in the original intent, we were to exercise the authority of God and dominate that and bring it back under the way God created it to be. Think about how Jesus spoke to those wind and the waves. One of the things Rick Renner brought out some years ago in a study of the Greek text, that when Jesus said, uh, peace, be still to that storm, he said, shh. Go back to your original way of, of, of operation. Go back to the way you were created to operate. In other words, the destruction was not the original way wind was created to operate. The destruction was not God's original intent. And, and a man in authority exercised dominion to bring it back to its place of authority. Alleluia. You made him to have dominion over the works of your hands. You have put, you have put, God has put all things under his feet. All sheep and oxen, yea, the beasts of the field, the fowl of the air and the fish of the sea and whatsoever passes through the seas. O oh Lord, our Lord, how excellent is your name in all the earth. Going back to Hebrews, we see this put in perspective of the fall. He says in verse 8 of Hebrews 2, You have put all things in subjection under his feet. For in that he put all in subjection under him. I love this. It's like reiterating how complete this dominion was. In that he put all in subjection under man. He left nothing that is not put under mankind. And then the very next part of this verse says, But now we see not yet all things put under him. But now, this was the way God originally created before the fall, but now we don't see this in operation. Now we don't see mankind operating that dominion and that authority and that executing that that capacity 
We don't see that. But we see Jesus. We see Jesus. We don't see this happening throughout mankind, but we see Jesus who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, a little lower than God, a little lower than Elohim. He's referring to the verse from Psalm 8. He's referring to the fact that Jesus became a man. Jesus became a man so that he could suffer death. God can't die. In order for Jesus to die, and we're going to look at why death was important, in order for him to die, he had to become a man. So this phrase, made a little lower than the angels, is the same phrase referred to about man. He was made in the image of man. He was made a man. We see Jesus who was made a man, a little lower than the angels, for the suffering of death. He, he was born for the purpose of dying. He, was, he came legally as a man so that he could legally die as our kinsman redeemer. If he had brought any of his omnipotence, omniscience, omnipresence, it would have disqualified him from being our redeemer. It would have disqualified him and made it illegal. But he came legally. And he did it legally. He was just. God is just in his redemption. Jesus, for the suffering of death, we see Jesus crowned with glory and honor. The original plan that God began in Adam, that Adam fell from, Jesus entered into. He was crowned with the glory that God had given man. He was crowned with the honor that God had given man that he, by the grace of God, should taste death for every man. We're going to come back to Hebrews 2, but I need you to go over to 1 Corinthians 15, and I need you to see something. Because in our mind, we see multitudes of, of men, mankind. We, see, we, we consider thousands and hundreds of thousands of people who have been born on the planet for the sake of, of putting this into perspective I want to use an illustration 1 Corinthians chapter 15 I want to use this illustration while you're finding that if you for instance in the automotive industry they create a model of a certain type of vehicle. Every vehicle created or, or formed after that model, they are all from that model, they're all identical to that model, but that model was the first of that car. And then all of the others that are created on that line are created after the model. Adam was the first model created. Every man born of the flesh was born with all of the equipment that Adam had at the time of the fall because when he began to have children it was after the fall. So that's why the body says the Bible says we were born in sin. Why we were born after the model that had fallen. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, look with me at verse 45. And so it is written, the first man, Adam, was made a living soul. The last Adam was made a quickening spirit. Howbeit that was not first which is spiritual, but that which is natural, and after, afterward that which is spiritual. The first man is of the earth earthy the second man well was Jesus the second person ever born on the planet well heavens no we know there were thousands of people born between the time that God created Adam and the time Jesus was birthed but the Bible refers to him as the second man because he was the second model God created Adam and God created Jesus God created Adam out of the dust of the ground and he breathed into him the breath of life. 
The Word became flesh to cause Jesus' body to be prepared, and the Word that Mary received gave life. In Him was life, and the life was the light of men. Jesus was born spiritually alive. He was born on this planet legally as a man with an earth body, with a man's body, with a, with a legal human body, and yet he was born in God's original plan with his spirit alive unto God, with the life of God in his spirit. Every other person on the planet was spiritually dead. Even those who had been keeping the law. It was the law of sin and death they were keeping. The law that governed people who were sinners by nature and spiritually dead. Praise God that we are no longer under the law of sin and death. But the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made us free from the law of sin and death. Why? Because we're no longer sinners by nature. We are not spiritually dead. We have been born again. That's why Jesus said in John chapter 3 to Nicodemus, you must be born again. He that is born of the flesh is flesh, but he that is born of the spirit is spirit. We've got to be born again. And Nicodemus and none of the other people at that time could understand what does he mean, born again? How can I return to my mother's womb? He was talking about born of the spirit born of the life of God in the heart of man, returning back to God's original plan and intent. So when we see this, we see that Jesus is called the last Adam, but in this verse 47, it refers to him as the second man. The, last, the word Adam really means man. So when we say he is he is. The last model. God's not going to need to not. He's not going to need to create another model. And on the assembly line, everyone who was created after the first Adam, it says, is earthy. But when we are born again, we step onto a new assembly line, and when we come out of the new birth. We are created with all of the bells and whistles and all of the full package, the fully loaded package that our Adam, Jesus Christ, the last Adam, the second man, the one that God is, is of the Spirit. We are equipped like him. We don't look like the old Adam anymore. Thank you, Jesus. We don't have the equipment that the old Adam have. We have the new updated version. <laughs> all of the spiritual supply, all of the spiritual equipment. That's why when you read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, it is incorrect to identify with the failures of the disciples of before the cross and say, well, you know, Peter, he, he, he was, you know, sinking down. I'm not built like Peter when he sank. I'm built more like Peter on the day of Pentecost when he stood up and preached with boldness. I'm not like Peter who denied Christ. I'm like the Peter who stood up and said, this, these men are not drunk as you suppose. I don't look like any of those disciples before the fall. I don't look like anybody on the planet before the fall except, I mean, I'm sorry, before the cross, except Jesus. When I read the Gospels, I need to identify with the one I look like. I look like the one standing on the, brow, the bow of the boat saying, peace be still. That's who I look like. I look like the one who stopped the widow of Nain's procession and said, uh, rise. And, and, and raised up that child, that young man from, from the casket. I look like the one who called Lazarus out of the tomb. That's who I'm built like. That's who you're built like. You're built like the one who caused the lame to walk. You're built like the one who, who stilled the seas. So that's who we need to identify with. We have his equipment. We have his supply. We have his provision. We're built like him. Praise God. Praise God. It's important to identify correctly. So Jesus came legally. The last Adam, the second man... We are born again of 
his lineage. And because we are in his image and in his likeness, we have the same authority that he has as the man on the earth submitted to God, alive unto God. Go with me to Philippians chapter 2 and let's look at verse 7. We are so completely, so completely united to Christ that we are referred to as his body. You can't separate my head from my body and me still be alive. We are the body of Christ. We are so connected to him that it refers to us as being the body connected to the head. In Philippians chapter 2, I'm going to read verse 7. I'm going to ask if you'll put that up on the Amplified for me. Uh, it says, he made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. This Amplified says, he became, he, he stripped himself of all privileges and rightful dignity so as to assume the guise of a servant in that he became like men and was born a human being. He was born a human being. The New English translation says he by sharing in human nature. The New Living says he became human by being born a man. He became human by being born a man. This in no way, shape, or form takes away from him being the Son of God. Adam was completely a son of God. Not the son of God. He was created by God. He was made in his image, in his likeness. He was not the second person of the Godhead like Jesus. But Adam was a son who fell. Jesus, the second person of the Godhead, the Word, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was made flesh. The Word made flesh and dwelt among us. Jesus, the second person of the Godhead, the Word of God made flesh, came and was born a man, which in no way takes away from His being the Son of God. He didn't have to stop being the Son of God. He didn't have to stop being the Son of God to become the Son of Man. That, this is what the previous verse said, verse 6. Who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery, to be equal with God. Show me the Amplified of verse 6. Who being essentially one with God and in the form of God, possessing the fullness of the attributes which make God God, he did not think this equality with God was a thing that he had to... He, he, he had to... He didn't think, I'm too big, I'm too important, I'm too good to become a man. He didn't think, I cannot become a man. We saw last time that we discussed this, how many times it refers to the fact that he, it behooved him. It, it was something he embraced. He said, yes, a body, you have prepared me. I come in the volume of the book to do your will. He embraced becoming a man. He didn't think, well, I am so much God, it is beneath me. Why? Because God doesn't see us as low class. This is where you've got to let the word of God renew your mind because sin consciousness makes people think, well, God sees us as low class. No, he doesn't. He sees us as children. He says, I know the thoughts that I have towards you, thoughts of good and not evil with an end and an expectation. He, his love for us, his love for us, he so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth on him shall have everlasting life. He loves us. He doesn't look at us as low class. He doesn't look at us as beneath. He looks at us as children. 
He looks at us as family. And Jesus made himself of no reputation. He humbled himself and became a man to redeem us. Glory to God. Glory to God. We're talking about authority. Let's go to John chapter 10. We're talking about authority. He, he embraced this road. He embraced this process necessary to redeem man. In John chapter 10, verse 1, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that enters not by the door into the sheepfold, but climbs up some other way, the same is a thief and a robber. But he that enters in by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. Jesus is teaching here. He says, he that enters not into the door by the, into the sheepfold by the door is a thief and a robber. What is the sheepfold? Where is the sheepfold? What is this sheepfold he's referring to? Earth. Earth is the place, the Lord says in, in Psalms, He says, we are the sheep of His pasture. We are the sheep of His pasture. So He that entered into the earth by a different way, that did not come to the door, He that enters not by the door, there's a door into the earth. There's a legal door entry into the earth. And the thief came in, not by the legal entry door, but he came up another way. He that enters in by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. Jesus is the shepherd. He entered in by the legal door into the earth. How, what is the legal door into the earth? Being born into the earth. That's what gives man legal authority to be in the earth. We were born here. Hallelujah. And Jesus being the shepherd of the sheep... He came in through the door. To him the porter opens and the sheep hear his voice and he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. And when he puts forth his own sheep, he goes before them and the sheep follow him for they know his voice. And a stranger they will not follow but will flee from him for they know the voice of the strangers. This parable spoke Jesus unto them but they understood not what things they were which he spoke unto them. Then said Jesus unto them again. Now he's explaining. He says, I am the door of the sheep. All that ever came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not hear them. I am the door. By me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved and shall go in and out and find pasture. The thief cometh not but for to steal and to kill and to destroy. I, the door, I am come that they might have life and they might have it more abundantly. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd gives his life for the sheep. So he's, he came in through the door and then he became the door. He came in legally through the door and now he is the door into spiritual the legal entry into being born again is to receive Jesus as Lord and Savior. He is now the door into the spiritual life. He came legally into the earth as a man through the door of being born. And through his salvation, we can legally enter into being born again. Amen. He came in through the door and he became the door. He says, I am the door to the sheep. He that comes... Through me. It says, by me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved. Enter into the door, Jesus, the door, you shall be saved. Praise God. Praise God. But notice that he identifies that there was, an, uh, that someone came in through an illegal way. And that person is referred to as a thief and a robber, our enemy, the adversary, the devil. And you know the devil is not his name. The devil is not a name, and that's why it's never really capitalized in the Bible. You notice it's always lowercase d, because that's really not his name. It's a, it's a description of how he operates. 
it's a twofold word, di diabolos. You come, if you hear it in Spanish, it kind of has that sound to it. But in the original language, it's, it's a compound word, dia and balo. And the, one of the words, one of the compound words, it means, one of the words of this compound word means to, to continually strike or to hit against something for the purpose of, of weakening it, for the purpose of breaking it down. And the other part of that word means to pierce or to penetrate. And it describes how he operates. That the enemy, the devil, he, com he continually batters and he batters and he brings those wrong thoughts and he brings those fear thoughts and he brings those, his purpose is to try to penetrate and get into, get into that situation. So when we look at this and we see that he came in another way, he came in, he came in and instead of man exercising authority over him, instead of Adam executing the authority and taking authority over him while he was having that discussion with Eve and saying, you're not going to talk to my wife like that, shut up. I command you to get out of that serpent and get off of my planet. Instead of doing that, he allowed, and Eve, who also had authority, they allowed him to continue talking, and there was no resistance, and they submitted to him. But notice, he's a thief and a robber. He's a thief and a robber. In 1 John chapter 4, verse 3, Every spirit that confesses not that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is not of God. This is how you can identify some of those religions. We know, of course, that demons don't want to admit it either. But religions that don't want to admit that Jesus came, born of a virgin, legally becoming a man... Hallelujah. Every spirit that confesses not that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is not of God. And this is that spirit of Antichrist whereof you have heard that it should come and even now already is in the world. If they will not admit that Jesus was born in the flesh, what they're, what they're saying is they won't admit that Jesus has authority. Why? Because who has authority on the earth? Mankind, righteous man has authority on the earth. Let's, let's identify that. Righteous man is the one who has the ability to exercise authority. And Jesus came, a righteous man. And because he was born on the earth, he had authority. But the demons did not want to admit it. And the Amplified says, it says, let me pull up verse uh, 3 in the Amplified because I only have a part of the phrase. I want to read the whole thing. Every spirit which does not acknowledge and confess that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh, but would annul, destroy, sever, disunite him. I think that's important. The ones who want to say the, 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 the wrong teaching or the demonic spirits that would want to say Jesus has not come in the flesh, what they're saying is that he's not connected to man. He's not a kinsman redeemer. He's not legally a redeemer. They would annul him. They would sever him. They would disunite him from us. They would say, you can't identify with him as a man. If I can't identify with him with a man, then who's my legal kinsman redeemer? You know what I'm referring to when I say kinsman redeemer? We see the shadow of it under the Old Testament when... when uh, uh, Ruth married Boaz. Boaz was the one who was legally a kinsman redeemer. And they went to Boaz and he redeemed all of Ruth's and Naomi's belongings and land through the, through the fact that he was a kinsman redeemer. It had to be someone in the lineage of their family. In order for Jesus to redeem us, he had to be connected to the family. He had to become a man to be the redeemer. So if, if, if a teaching or an enemy spirit would want to deceive someone into thinking that Jesus did not legally become a man, they're disuniting him from being our kinsman redeemer. 
They're saying we don't have connection with him. Glory to God. I want to read this from the Phillips translation. Phillips is an older translation, and I really like this. And it's going to, I'm going to bring verses 1 through 3 to you. Don't trust every spirit, dear friends of mine, but test them to discover whether they come from God or not. For the world is full of false prophets. You can test them in this simple way. Every spirit that acknowledges the fact that Jesus Christ actually became a man comes from God. Every spirit that acknowledges the fact, or you could say every teaching that acknowledges the fact, or you could say every doctrine that acknowledges the fact, or every, every uh, uh, church belief system that acknowledges the fact that Jesus Christ actually became a man comes from God. But the spirit which denies this fact does not come from God. The latter comes from the Antichrist, which you were warned would come and which is already in the world. Now, let's see these demon spirits refusing to acknowledge Jesus' authority. We have scripture for it. Matthew 8, verse 28. When he was come to the other side of the country of the Gergesenes, there met him two possessed with devils coming out of the tombs, exceeding fierce, so that no man might pass by that way. And behold, they cried out, saying, What have we to do with you, Jesus, thou Son of God? Are you come here to torment us before the time? That's pretty audacious of a conversation to have with him. Especially if they really knew he was the Son of God, which they did. If they knew he was the Son of God, what made them think they could speak to him in that manner? That they could, that they could, you could say if you wanted to, that they came up and thumped his chest. What are you doing here? Like a confrontation, that they came up with a shove and that push, like, hey, you're not allowed to be here. I know who you are. And, and this, this open accusation, you're the son of God. What are you doing here? What have we to do with you, Jesus, thou son of God? Opening the, that, identifying, I know who you are, the son of God. Are you come here to torment us before the time? We also can see this in Luke chapter 4, verse 33. In the synagogue there was a man which had a spirit of an unclean devil and cried out with a loud voice saying, Let us alone. <laughs> Again, what a brazenness to tell Jesus, Let us alone. Leave us alone. What do we have to do with you, you Jesus of Nazareth? Are you come to destroy us? I know who you are. Now see, Jesus of Nazareth was a way of identifying him as a man. And that was almost like they were, they were saying, you, you, Jesus of, you, you say you're Jesus of Nazareth. You're pretending to be Jesus of Nazareth. We know who you are. You know, God identified and Peter identified, let me put it, the Holy Spirit through Peter in Acts chapter 10 verse 38 identified how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth, who went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed of the devil, for God was with him. Why did he uh, 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 identify him as Jesus of Nazareth? He was legally here as a man, anointed by God, alive with the life of God in his spirit, to do the will of God and to, because God was with him. Well, these demons... They are trying to say, you, Jesus of Nazareth, what do we have to do with you, Jesus of Nazareth? Are you come to destroy us? I know who you are. There's the accusation. I know who you are. There's no respect in that. There's no honor in that. There's no submission in that. It was defiant. It was rebellious. I know who you are. Why? Because they did not believe Jesus had authority. They thought Jesus was in a human body as God. 
They did not realize he was legally in that body and could execute the authority that God had, had commissioned to man. We know who you are, the Holy One of God. And Jesus rebuked him saying, hold your peace and come out. And when the devil had thrown in the mist, he came out of him and hurt him not. Why? Because Jesus had the authority. Those demons didn't think he had. When he spoke, they had to obey. They had to respond. They had to, they had to submit because here is a righteous man exercising authority, a righteous man full of the life of God. Just like you and I, we are the righteousness of God. In Christ Jesus, notice our end, notice our position. In Christ Jesus, we are the righteousness of God. We have the life of God in us. We are anointed with the Holy Spirit and God is with us. Hallelujah. Look again in this same chapter. I want to look at, uh, let's finish. I want to read verse 36. They were all amazed and spoke among themselves saying, what a word is this? For with authority and power, he commands the unclean spirits. Notice this. They, the people standing around recognized authority. With authority and power, he commands the unclean spirits and they come out. Same chapter, verse 40. When the sun was setting, all they that had sick, any sick with diverse diseases, brought, him, brought them unto him and he laid his hands on every one of them and healed them. And devils also came out of many, crying out and saying, You are Christ, the Son of God. They weren't doing that to announce it for His benefit. They weren't doing that to, to worship Him or to honor Him. They were doing that in a way to try to resist Him from bringing them out, from casting them out. They were trying to... to Say, you don't have authority to cast me out. You are Christ, the Son of God. You can't do this. Only man has authority here. You're God, not man, is what they were saying. They didn't understand. How could God get inside a man? How could God legally become a man? That's what it, in 1 Corinthians chapter 2 when it says the princes of this world. We speak the gospel in a mystery. The princes of this world, had they known, they would never have crucified the Lord of glory. He's crowned with glory and honor. They would never have crucified Jesus if they realized the wisdom of God. How God put in a human form legally Jesus the Son of God, all God and all man, completely the son of God, completely the son of man, legally the son of man and righteous by nature as the son of God. Amen. Hallelujah. Mark 5, verse 5. And always night and day, he, legion, was in the mountains and in the tombs, crying and cutting himself with stones. But when he saw Jesus afar off, he ran and worshipped him and cried with a loud voice and said, What have I to do with you, Jesus, you son of the Most High God? I adjure you by God. That is a military command in the original language. I command you by God. By God? I command you by God? He's, he is so convinced, this demon is so convinced that Jesus is illegally here, that he's calling on God's right, God's righteousness. I command you by God, a demon, a demon. I command you by God that you torment me not. Why? Because he thought he was the son of the most high God only. Do you notice that they could all recognize the life of God in him? Those demons knew there was life of God in him. That's why when I say he was the only person on the planet who had the life of God in him, they could see it. They could see the light. 
the light. Notice how John 1, and I've quoted it earlier, but John 1 says, In him was the life, and the life was the light of men. In him was life. He came spiritually alive, and all of us who believe on him, we're born again and made alive unto God. And in that life, there's light in us that the enemy knows when we walk in a room, the righteous have just walked in the room. There's one of those sons of God. Back up, back up, everybody. Here's one of those sons of God. And if they know who they are, we might be in trouble. We might be in for a fight. If they know who we are, if they know, if they know who they are, amen? If we know our righteousness, if we know our position, if we know our, our, our condition of being in Him, if we know our, our equippings in Christ, we'll exercise the authority to see the will of God done in the situations we encounter. That's the, God's desire for every one of His body, every member of His body, for us to be so aware of who we are that when we encounter something that is going against the will of God, that we exercise our authority to speak to it, to, to dominate it, to, to bring it under subjugation, to exercise authority and dominion in that situation, to see it turn back in the direction God wants it to go. Hallelujah. Glory to God. John chapter 5. Let's look at verse 26. And 27. For as the Father has life in himself, so has he given to the Son to have life in himself. Recognizing he was spiritually alive with the life of the Father. And then notice this next phrase. He has given him authority to execute judgment also because he is the son of man. How did he gain? When, why did God give him this authority? Because he was legally the son of man. So he was spiritually alive and physically alive. Glory to God. This is the authority that we have on the earth. Do you notice after Jesus resurrected from the dead, all that he did was delegated authority. There are no recordings in the Bible. There's no scriptural reference in the Bible to Jesus healing anyone after the resurrection, causing any blind eyes to open after the resurrection, raising any dead after the resurrection. We don't see any reference of that. But he says, all authority in heaven and earth has been given unto me. And he delegates that authority by sending his disciples in his name. Yeah. Amen? Amen? Now before I get into next, my, next installment, I don't want to move too far ahead because we're going to talk about that next week. But I want to go right now and I want to talk just uh, quickly about... Uh, some ways that he exercised authority. First, go with me to Matthew 9, 2 through 6. Matthew 9, verse 2. And behold, they brought to him a man sick of the palsy, lying on a bed. And Jesus, seeing their faith, said unto the sick of the palsy, Son, be of good cheer. Your sins be forgiven thee. And behold, certain of the scribes said within themselves, This man blasphemes. And Jesus, knowing their thoughts, said, Why do you think evil in your hearts? For whether it is easier to say, Your sins be forgiven you, or to say, Arise and walk, but that you may know that the Son of Man has power on the earth. Notice he identifies himself as the Son of Man. The Son of Man has power on earth to forgive sins. Then he said to the sick of the palsy, Arise, take up your bed, and go into your house. And he arose and departed into his house. And when the multitude saw, they marveled and glorified God, which had given such 
power. I want you to, I want you to circle, underline, mark this word power. In the Greek, in the New Testament, there's two words that the Greek, the New Testament, English, always translates power. One of them is exousia, and one of them is dunamis in the original language. For instance, when Jesus said in the book of Luke, Behold, I give unto you power to tread on serpents and scorpions. It was the word exousia, which means authority, right to govern, jurisdiction. I give you jurisdiction to tread on serpents and scorpions. I give you power over all the power. I give you jurisdiction over all the power of the enemy. But in Acts chapter 1 verse 8, when he said, you shall receive power, that's a different word. In the original language, it's the word dunamis, which is talking about miraculous, explosive, anointing power. Right? So when we see this, this is the word exousia. He had given such authority to men. God has given such jurisdiction to men. God has given such right to govern. They glorified God, which had given this right to govern unto Jesus. Hallelujah. How did he exercise this right to govern? How did he, how did he apply it? How did he distribute this authority? How did he put this authority into action? He said, thy sins be forgiven thee. Rise up and walk. Arise, take up your bed and go into your house. With words, with a command, with a command, he exercised, exercised this authority. Now, in Luke chapter 7, verse 14. And he came and touched the bier, and they that bare him stood still. And he said, this is the, the coffin. The, they were in the procession to carry this uh, young man to bury him, the widow of Nain's son. Though that were, those that were carrying him stood still. And Jesus said, young man, I say unto you, arise. And he that was dead set up. And began to speak, and he delivered him to his mother. Jesus has just exercised authority over death and brought life back into this, this person, and he exercised the authority with his words, I say unto you, arise. In Luke 8, 54, we see him exercising this authority. And he put all them out and took her by the hand and called, saying, Maid, arise. And her spirit came again, and she arose straight away, and he commanded to give her meat. How did he exercise this authority? With his words. With his words. John chapter 11, 43. J.I., I'm sorry, Lazarus was raised from the dead as Jesus exercised authority and called him back. John 11, 43. And when he had thus spoken, he cried aloud with a, he cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. And he that was dead came forth, bound hand and foot with grave clothes, and his face was bound with a napkin. Jesus said unto them, Loose him and let him go. We have other ex examples. I'm not going to go through all of them, but how Jesus, with his word, healed the sick. How Jesus exercised authority over demons. We've looked at some of those examples. How Jesus, even with the wind and the waves, we talked about that. He spoke to the wind, peace, be still. He exercised authority on the earth with words. During the time that Brother Hagen was pastoring, he pastored about 12 years out of his ministry, those first 12 years, and during that time, his <clears throat> Sunday school superintendent, he said he was very important to him. He said he was the first Sunday school superintendent that actually did anything, <laughs> didn't just hold a position, and, and he had to do all the work. He said, this man helped me. He was a tither. He was a... Uh, a, a leader, he would go and visit people if they missed Sunday school. He would come and, and, and really just bring a, a help and a, a work to uh, the church. 
and this Sunday school superintendent fell into some machinery. He worked in the oil rigs and he, he fell into some machinery and actually Brother Hagen and a guest minister were out driving around with a speaker on the top of the car. This was way back in the early, probably late 40s, early 50s. And they were telling people about a revival that was going to be taking place at the church. And he had just left from that work site and was driving along. He said somebody came pulling up behind him, honking the horn. And they pulled over and they said, you've got to come back. And they said this, uh, this superintendent's name. They said he's fallen and they said he's dead. He's dead. He said, I just saw him. They said, he's fallen off the oil rig, and they say he's dead. He's fallen into this machinery. And he gets there, and the doctor is there. They've already called the man's wife. The wife comes in, and the doctor looks at Brother Hagen, and he says, you need to help his wife. He's not going to make it. He's just barely alive, but I don't even think I can get him to the hospital before he dies. And so he turns around to, and she said, the doctor thinks he's not going to make it. She knew what the doctor was thinking all just by the look on their faces. And, and she said, the doctor thinks he's not going to make it, doesn't he? And Brother Hagen said, yes. She goes, well, he doesn't know we've got inside information. And she and Brother Hagen started praying. And so here's the doctor thinking he's going to die right there before they even get him loaded into the ambulance. And for, he just keeps hanging on. And so they put him in the uh, ambulance. And the doctor rides with in the ambulance and goes to the, the county hospital thinking he's going to die before he gets there. But he didn't. He continued. And, and his, they got him into the hospital. And because, it, it, you know, medication and, and doctors weren't as advanced as they are, they didn't have a lot that they could do. And they said, there's really, he's in, his body is in shock. There's not a lot that we can do for him right now except just try to keep him alive. And if he starts showing some, some different signs, we may be able to do some other things. And so they were just trying to keep him alive. And so Brother Hagen and this man's wife took turns staying in the intensive care unit while they were just keep barely his, his situation, his condition hadn't changed. It was still on the very edge of death. Brother Hagen said that during the night, he would stay there during the night and she would stay there during the day. And he said there would be times when the nurse would come over and check the man's fingernails and said, well, I thought he died. It looked, he, he had, his breathing had been so non-existent, they thought that he died. And she said, but no, he came back again. And, and Brother Hagen a couple of times went out into the hallway and was praying. And he said he got out there and, and was praying one, one time he, he, he said, I was just starting to walk the hallway because, you know, he kind of got sleepy sitting in the chair and he's walking the hallway and he's praying for this man. And he begins to talk to the Lord. He said, I started to talk to him in a way that I didn't, didn't realize. He said, I, I didn't plan it. I didn't intend to have this kind of a conversation. But I started saying things like, Lord, I need him. And if I need him, you need him. I need him in the church. He's one of the best super Sunday school superintendents I've ever had. I need him. He's a tither. He's one of the few men in the church who's tithes. I need him in the church. And if I need him, Lord, you need him. And he started, he started talking to him and saying, I'm not going to let him die. I'm not going to let him die. And he said, he said it so shocked him. The way that he prayed for this man when he was having this conversation with the Lord, saying, I'm not going to let him die, Lord. No, I'm not going to let him die. I need him and you need him. And he said it came out with such a boldness that he did not plan. You know, he didn't talk about it to anybody. He didn't tell anybody that for years about that conversation he had in that prayer. You hear him testify about it later. It was something that he'd never been taught. It was something he'd never experienced before. He said, but after having that conversation, he went back in and that man's condition began to improve. And by later that day, they were, he had improved to the point that they could do some other treatments on him. Months later, after he had completely recovered and come back to the church, Brother Hagen had him tell a testimony in the church. And he got up to testify, and he began to testify. And Brother Hagen said, I had not talked to him. 
I had not told my wife how I prayed. I had not told him how I prayed. I had not told a soul because it had been such a shock about how bold-faced I was in my conversation with God to say, Lord, I'm not going to let him die. If I need him, you need him. He said, I had not told anybody about that. But this man begins to testify, and he was testifying, and he said, don't anybody ever be afraid to die. He said, when I died, I didn't even feel the pain of hitting that machinery. He said, I was already out of my body by the time I hit that machinery. And he said, I never felt any pain. I was immediately in peace. I was immediately in the presence of God. And he said, I was, I was walking in and Jesus said to me, you've got to go back. And he said, but Lord, I don't want to go back. And Jesus said, you've got to go back. This man's testimony, Jesus said, you've got to go back. And he took his hand and he said, it was like there was a curtain and he pulled this curtain back and he said, Brother Hagen won't let you come. <laughs> and he said he could see Brother Hagen praying for him. Brother Hagen said, I never told him how I prayed. I never told him about having that conversation, that prayer like that. Jesus said, Brother Hagen won't let you come. He said years later, his mother got to a certain age and began to have some physical symptoms in her body. And, and um, he said, I found myself having one of those conversations with God again. And I said, Lord, I don't want her to die. I, he said he, he had been, he, she was not, you know, brought up in the word of faith. She was not, uh, um, have that foundation, uh, you know, and, and, he was able to do a lot of the praying and pull her through some things. And so here she was in this situation. He begins to talk to God and he said, Lord, I, I'm not, I don't want her to die. And the Lord said, I'll do what you say. And he said, I want you to give her until, I think he said 92. or cer He said a certain age. I'm not going to quote the age. But he said, I want you to give her 10 more years. And he quoted that, that age. And he said, if I look back on it, he said, I probably should have let her go because she suffered a lot and because her faith wasn't strong to be able to receive her healing. She suffered a lot. He said, it was selfish on my part, the reason I kept her, but God honored him. The very year that he had said to God that 10 years was when she went to heaven. He didn't talk about that a lot, but if you begin to listen to his teachings about authority, he brings out, there's authority we have with God that we haven't tapped into until we begin to take our place in Christ and we begin to exercise this authority. It's, this authority is linked to the will. When we know it's God's will, when we know it's, 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 it's the will of God, we can enforce it. That's why we have authority to lay hands on the sick and they shall recover because healing is always the will of God. Always. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I encourage you to let the Word of God strengthen you in the authority that you have in Him. It's Jesus' authority. He's delegated it to us. It's His authority. He gained that authority by His victory. He gained that authority by His obedience. It's His authority, and we, it's ours in Him. It's His and it's ours. It's part of our inheritance. It's his and it's ours because he's delegated it to us. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Father, we're grateful that you have chosen us, that you have called us according to your purpose. Lord, that you have drawn us out. You have redeemed us. You have purchased us with your own blood. We're so grateful, Lord to be your children, your heirs, to be your, the body of Christ on this earth at this time. Father, I pray for this congregation to enter into the fullness of our equippings, to enter into the fullness of the blessing 
the fullness of our salvation, the fullness of our righteousness, the fullness of our position in Christ. Father, I pray that you would bring us into that maturity that you talk about in Ephesians chapter 4 until that we are in the fullness of the stature of Christ. Let the anointings that you desire to operate in us be in full manifestation and operation. Let the... That let the, the equippings, let the spiritual provisions be in place. Father, let the authority be in operation. And let us be mature in everything pertaining to your word and your kingdom. Father, that we would grow. Father, that I could present your people before you with a fullness and a strength and a power that you desire for them to have. Father, as their pastor, I'm asking you, help us grow. Help us individually grow in our walk with you and our walk as a corporate body. That we would increase in love one toward another. Hallelujah. 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 Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father, for this church family. Thank you, Lord, for bringing us together. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Oh, Father, make us accurate for your plan, for your purpose, what you want us to do at this time. Let us be in synchronization with you. Let us be on target for what you have assigned for this time, for this hour. Prepare us, Lord. Prepare us. Prepare us for this end time move. Prepare us for this harvest. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Prepare. Thank you, Lord. Maruko so maloka shine me. See to the coast of a class and to the make it up a high. Care of Coso Coco Robacata. Nepo Coso Co Breverito Basea. Cabra Berundo so Mariamo no Coco Manahai. Araba Coso Tomarahai. Thank you, Jesus. Glory to your name. 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 We worship you, Lord. We worship you, Lord. We worship you, Lord. Oh, Lord, you're good. You're so good to us. You're so good to us. Hallelujah. I want you to say this out loud, would you please? Father, I desire to walk in your fullness, to walk in everything you have prepared me for and everything you have prepared for me. I receive your leading. I yield to the guidance of the Spirit of God. I receive your word. And I respond with my obedience. I receive your plan. And I embrace everything you have destined for me. In Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Glory to God. Glory to God. I believe God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. 
Thank you, Lord. His word is so good. His word is so good. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Well, I believe you've received tonight. Amen. Let's stand together, if you would, please, to your feet. I do want to encourage you. This is a book by Charles Capps about your spiritual authority. We have it available in our bookstore. Uh, our teaching is not necessarily from this, although uh, he was one of the first people that helped me when he came to our church years ago in Kansas and ministered about the authority of Jesus. And so I encourage you, uh, that is a, a book that will help you understand more from what we've talked about tonight. Amen? Praise God. Graduates, all of our, we've got a final exam tomorrow, students. Final exam. Hallelujah. And remember that we do have graduation practice on Saturday at 11 and lunch following at 12 for all of those who are graduating. And then graduation is this Sunday. Now, the graduation service will be taking place during the service, but Pastor Philip will be preaching. So uh, don't think, well, we're not going to have service. No, we're going to have service, but it, it, it will include that as part of the preliminaries. Amen. So I'm going to give this to you so you'll remember to announce that to the students tomorrow for the practice. Praise God. And for those of you who would like, we are already enrolling for the next FBIMA. So if you'd like to register, it will start in December. And you can, uh, they're going to have a registration table for anybody who might be interested on Sunday. And then they'll leave packets with us for us, for anybody who might think about it later. Amen. Let's declare the vision of our church. The vision of this church is to build people's faith and frame their world by the word of God. You and I will always be world changers. God bless you. I love you all.